Good morning, y'all. Happy Sunday. Don't feel free to get up on our worship with us, y'all. Here we are. There is a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of a Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray. We hear praises, he hears faith. There is a sound I love to hear It's the sound of a Savior's robe As he walks into the room Where people pray When we hear worship He hears faith He hears faith oh, He hears faith When we praise Sing Awake My Soul Awake my soul and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise aloud. Oh, awake my soul and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise aloud. sound that changes things, the sound of his people on their knees. Wake up, you slumbering, it's time to worship him. Wake my soul and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise aloud. And when he moves, and when we pray, where stood a wall now stands away, where every promise is amen. Don't hold it 
sing his praise aloud, sing his praise aloud. <laughs> That's right. Y'all go ahead and lift up a praise. Y'all clap your hands. That's right. Y'all thank y'all so much for being here this morning. We're so glad y'all are here joining us this, this fine, fine Sunday. Y'all, it's time for, time for some announcements, y'all. We want to welcome everybody, of course, here in person, everybody watching us online. We say a big good morning to you guys as well. Um, if you're not already online, y'all, make sure to check us out online, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, fallcitychristian.com. It's all there for you. Uh, so make sure to check out those links. Um, also, while you're here, you can, you can follow links on there or just text your tithes to 84321 um, or just drop it in the offering plate. Um, as well, we, we have our, our bulletins back, finally. So if you guys want to, if you have any prayer requests or anything, just tear off this, this little guy on the bottom, drop that in the, in the offering plate too. Uh, we'd love to, love to pray for you, love to pray, pray with you. So if you need anything, just, just let us know. We're here for you guys. Um, also, if this is your first time here, uh, feel free to reach out to one of us here on the team. Reach out to Tim. We would love to get in touch with you, kind of hear your story, and, and just talk with you. We're glad you guys are are here joining us. Uh, we have a lot of other, other announcements, but they're all right here. So make sure you get them. I'll save you the time. But the most exciting one, I think, is the fifth Sunday meal is coming up October 31st, a special Halloween edition. Um, so that's the 31st. Make sure you stay tuned for that. That's right, y'all. Other than that, let's praise. <laughs> all right, let's get back to it, y'all. <clears throat> in Jesus We find our hearts have been open True lives are finally broken Revived we're putting our hope in have been reborn, yeah, yeah. Burned out, and now we're on fire. No doubt we're shining much brighter. So that we're lifting you higher, Lord. Children 
this lady she'd been bleeding for 12 years and she knows that the law the Jewish law says that she cannot even be touched or be around people but she hears of this man that is in the town and if she can just touch him she knows that she'll be healed So she goes to the town and there's a crowd around Jesus, huge crowd, but she can't touch anybody. So how can she get to Jesus? So she pushes her way through and people are kind of pushing back and she can't really get through. So she drops down to her hands and her knees and she starts weaving through people's legs. She finally gets to Jesus's cloak and she reaches out And she touches it. And she's healed. And Jesus stops. Because power had just left him. And he says, who's touched me? And all of his disciples say, well, you know, we're all all together. We're all banging up against each other. We're touching each other. Everybody's touching you. He said, no, no, no. Who touched me? You see, her faith in reaching out and touching Jesus' cloak healed her. So Jesus knew who touched her, right? But did she know who she just touched? Did she know that she just touched the Son of the living God? So he says, who has touched me? finally she raises her head up she says it was me Lord this story always amazed me because Jesus healed her because of her faith so then why did he need to ask her if she touched him what was for her she needed to know and she needed to acknowledge who her Lord was. So I ask you, who's your Lord? Who's the Lord of your life? Who's the Lord of your finances? Who's the Lord of your marriage? Or who's the Lord of your relationship? Who's the Lord of your parenting? Who is your Lord? This is the time when we have to be in our own hearts, in our own minds, and acknowledge who our Lord is. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you. We thank you for the opportunity to let to allow us to for our faith to heal us, but only you can let us know who's in control. Let us know who is Lord. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to just be at church and just be in your presence and just be for, here for you. We ask that all the hearts and minds be open and that they be willing to take on you. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
be more loved than I am right now Wasn't holding you up So there's nothing I can do to let you down It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud And I'll never be more loved than I am right now through a storm but I won't go down I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the wind to calm me out you would cross an ocean so I wouldn't drown you've never been closer than you are right now Yeah, how I feel right now on a mountaintop I can see so clear what it's all about So stay by my side when the sun goes down I don't want to forget how I feel right now
We know your promise is peace. Your promise is contentment. Your promise is not happiness. There's a difference between happiness and contentment. And it's okay. Let's not be jumping off the walls in excitement all the time. But you give us peace. Peace to just be with you. Peace to be still. Still in our hearts. Still in our minds. Still in our soul. Still with other people. And just be comfortable in your presence. Thank you so much for everything you give us. You are Jaira. You are enough. And my friend asked me, what, what does Jaira mean? And I know some of y'all might have been wondering if you've never heard this song, what does Jaira mean? And it, it's a place. It's a place where the Lord provides for us. He says, we are enough. We are enough because he is enough. And therefore, we are enough. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. I don't know what you want me to do with this. <laughs> I just said that right there. Boop. <laughs> All right, guys, what's up? Happy Sunday. Uh, we had a late night last night. We had a lot of fun. I'm tired. So uh, thanks, Chris, for um, dialing it in for us so I didn't have to drum this morning. That was nice. And thanks, Quentin, for stepping in and doing communion meditation because um, I'm just getting old and I can't do what I did last night very often. So anyways, it's October. Yeah, spooky. I, I love Halloween. Like, I love Halloween. As a matter of fact, yesterday I sat down uh, with Aaron and the boys, and we watched the new uh, Muppet Haunt Haunted Mansion uh, movie on Disney+, Plus, and it was amazing. I'm excited about that. Um, and so I decided, since it was Halloween season, since it was October, since it was um, pumpkin spice latte season, um, that I would do a series on fear. I don't know what pumpkin spice latte has to do with that other than um, sorority girls in vests and tights and the Ugg boots, and they look like Han Solo. Anyways, but anyways, um, <laughs> the, the scary stuff, the fear, the fear thing, not, not <laughs> I always do this. I say stuff that's not scripted, and it gets me in trouble later on, so I'm just going to go ahead and apologize now. Okay. So not so much the stuff that we typically talk about being afraid of, you know, like the spiders and the ghosts and monsters and the spooky stuff, but I wanted to, I wanted to talk about some things that we're really afraid of, but we don't typically talk about, right? Because sometimes it's hard to pin down uh, why or how we are afraid of that. Like last week, we talked about being afraid of the dark, right? And I'm going to ask again, anybody afraid of the dark? can't see because these lights... It's dark out there. It's bright up here. So Quentin's afraid of the dark. He's the only one. He's the only sissy in the whole bunch of you. Anyways, not, not so much like the, the, the creepy thing, but, but like the dangerous part of it, like being left in the dark on something or feeling like you have to hide something in the dark. And what we kind of concluded last week is that um, 
is that light exposes things that could be potentially dangerous. So as we lean into Jesus, who is light, right? Then we expose that which is dangerous. So today I want to talk about something uh, that has messed up more lives than anything in all of history. People. I want to talk about people, right? Because people have a way of screwing things up. I don't, it's, it's just, it's just what we do y'all, right? You can take a perfect environment. I don't know. I'm just throwing this out there, making it up off the top of my head, like the garden of Eden. Um, and you introduce people into the situation and guess what happens? The wheels fall off of it. It, it, it the fertilizer hits the fan, right? And, and, as, and as soon as people start doing their thing, we screw something up. Our, our selfishness, our greed, our pride, our, our lack of awareness, just kind of breaks things, right? And have you, any of you guys ever been there, done that? I know that I have. I mean, I have the potential to do that every Sunday morning when I get up here and talk, right? I mean, look at the church. Look at the church as a whole, right? The church at its core is beautiful. The church at its core is the perfect bride of Christ, meant to be the vessel of hope for the world. Until you introduce people into it, right? Then for some, it becomes a game to gain power or to feed your pride or a, a place for modern day Pharisees to thrive, right? To be in control. Or, or look at our nation. I mean, you can't even really be a person in our nation right now because whatever person you are is offensive to somebody, right? I mean, somebody's going to complain about who you are. And now with the internet, the offended can air their grievances to the entire world and get a whole bunch of people on their side about how they don't like who you are. They'll scream and they'll cry and they'll cancel and they'll boycott and they'll pick it and they'll type and type and type and type and hide behind their keyboard, right? All because you don't live exactly like they want you to. And the thing about it is, if you lived exactly like them, then you would be those very people spending their value, valuable time here on earth just harassing others for not being the way that you are, right? Hating on people for not sinning the way that you sin, right? And so it's, it's hard. People are scary. It's hard to even be a person right now. And these, these people that, that, that we pick on or harass or, or are offended by, most of these people just want to get through their freaking work week and, and, spend, and spend some time with their friends and family on the weekend. But all of a sudden, we're thrown into this hurricane of offense and defense, right? People actually spend time and effort to tear down other people. How is that good? Like, honestly, how is that good? It's not. But the thing about it is, is people do people-y things. And we screw things up. It's kind of a, a catch-22. Ultimately, I know that whenever I die, I will experience heaven and all of its glory. But I'm still afraid of what people are capable of here. I probably shouldn't be. But if I'm being honest with you guys... I'm afraid of what people are capable of doing here. Right or wrong, that's just my truth right now. Like, people freak me out. I don't know what they're capable of. Okay? I know. It's, it, it's like I said, it's a catch-22. It's funny because it's ridiculous, but it's also sad and scary. So I want to I process through some of these things today. It's, a, it's, it's like a, a broad topic, and it may not be pretty or it may not be put together, but I want to try and talk about kind of my fear of people. Maybe there can be some conclusions here. Maybe uh, between what I always hope my, my sermons are, are uh, the beginning of a conversation for a bunch of people. I just want to throw some morsels out there for people to chew on so that it becomes a conversation. So hopefully this begins a conversation that brings us to some, some conclusions. So I want to unpack a familiar story, uh, but I, I want you, before we even get started, to think about your role 
in this story. I want you to place yourself in this story. All right, you ready? Let's get it. All right, it says, Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes and beat him up and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed over to the other side of the road and passed by him. A temple assistant, which I kind of classify as a worship pastor, right? A Levite, you know, probably wearing his skinny jeans and, and his little camouflage hoodie and hiding back here in the back, right? Um, <laughs> temple assistant walked over and, and looked at him lying there. But he also passed by on the other side, right? Then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds and, uh, with olive oil and wine, and he bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll, I'll pay for it next time that I get here. Um, so Jesus says, now which, which one of these three would you say was the neighbor to the man attacked by the bandits? Well, the man replied, the one who showed mercy. Then Jesus said, yeah, go and do the same thing. All right? It's, it's pretty simple. It's a pretty simple story whenever you think about it. I mean, so I'd be willing to say that most people have heard this story in some way, shape, or fashion, even if it's not necessarily even presented as a Bible story. It's a, like a, a call for basic human decency in the face of human indecency, right? So what I want to do is I want to look at some of the details in this story that can, can help us become better people to the world around us, right? Right? And the first thing that I noticed um, in this is directional descent, okay? Um, directional descent, like where are you heading? Where are you going? What, what are your goals? What is your purpose for going the direction that you are going in? What happened to put you on the path of the direction that you are going in? Verse 1 said, a Jewish man was heading down to Jericho, right? Now, really quick, uh, the symbolism here is that the Jewish man was walking away from Jerusalem on a road roughly 18 miles long. It was about 18 miles from, from Jerusalem to Jericho, all right? And within that 18 miles, the decline in elevation was about 2,500 foot, about half a mile decline, Okay? And, and, so, and so what would happen is that would be down, downhill, at a pretty good rate, okay? So he was literally and figuratively going down, right, to Jericho. At this, at this point in time in history, the temple was in Jerusalem, and this is where God was, so this is where you wanted to be. So if you're walking away from Jerusalem and toward Jericho, you're walking away from the presence of God in the temple here. And this is a, a parable, so um, it's, a, it's a story being told by Jesus, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, and, uh, which ha has all kinds of symbolism to it. So when he's telling this story, it's laced with a lot of stuff. And he understands like the crowd that he's talking to. All right. So there's a lot of symbolism. So he's implying that those walking from Jerusalem to Jericho are heading in a, a downward path away from the presence of God. Doesn't sound too good, does it? That sounds bad, because that's what people do, bad things, right? The Bible actually says no one is good. So if you come in here thinking you're good, well, your mindset contradicts the word of God. I just want to throw that out there. Now let's get going. And you're kind of a jerk. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, I'm not kidding. Anyways, so to some... They would think, well, he's walking down and away from the presence of God. He gets jumped by some bandits. He's left laying by the road. Well, he gets what he deserves. He's walking away from God. Gets what he deserves, right? He's not being obedient. He's not being faithful. He just gets what he deserves. 
He deserves to be left dead or four dead alongside the road. And I know, how, do you know how ridiculous that sounds? Because like I just said, no one is good. It is ridiculous, but there are people like that. There are people that think, well, they got what they deserved. And that kind of scares me a little bit. Now, I understand consequences. I understand natural consequences. But, I mean, come on. Let's, let's just continue with the story. I don't want to get hung up on that. Anyways, so um, this priest is walking by along the road, all right? And I want to throw in a little deductive reasoning here. So let's just say in 30 AD, um, people were right, and they drove on the right side of the road. You follow? So you got your lanes. You drive on the right side of the road like God intended it, right? And if the priest came across the man and then he crossed the road to get around him to pass him by, that means this priest was also walking down and away from the presence of the Lord. Does that make sense? He was heading down and away to Jericho. Now, a little worship pastor kid, the temple assistant, he walked over and he looked, but then he passed by on the other side too. And let's just, let's just pretend like this is a, a four-lane road, okay? So you got two lanes. So maybe the worship pastor was driving slow in the left lane because that's what someone who is walking away from God would do, right? <laughs> driving slow in the left lane. Those people need Jesus, Right? But I believe Jesus was implying that, that both of these guys were walking from Jerusalem to Jericho, which implied a descent from the presence of God. This directional descent was carrying them all in a downward spiral, right? Now, these church people could have been on official church business. They could have had official reasons to go to Jericho, right? Right? Like, spread the love of God to the city of Jericho. That sounds good, right? And they were perfectly willing to do that. They just weren't willing to do that on the way to Jericho. So it makes me question where their heart really was in this situation. I'd say that the religious leaders were more interested in enforcing the law of Moses than spreading the love of God. And we get hung up on that. You want to know why? Because we're people. And people are scary. You never know what they're going to come on with, right? You, you know those, those people who put the principle before people? Because it expresses some sort of power. You know those people who get so hung up on the, on the principle that they're willing to, to kill relationships. They're willing to, to, to kill friendship. They're willing to attack people in the name of principle. I don't know that that's what God intended. And the scary thing is, is, is when we are in dissent, I, I don't even know that we're seeing clearly. I don't necessarily believe that we, we, we value people in the midst of our dissent sometimes, right? Like, for instance, tomorrow I'm heading south. I'm flying to Florida uh, to hang out at home a little bit. I call Disney home because I just, I just feel good there. And um, anyways, and so I'm going south. Like, that's a descent, right? I'm heading south, but that doesn't mean I have to become a Florida man. You guys know the whole Florida man thing? Have you heard of that? I'll give you permission right now if you want to. Google Florida man and then your birthday. There's always something crazy that a, a Florida man did on your birthday. I promise. Like, for instance, my birthday is June 1st. Headline, Florida man, June 1st. Florida man arrested after pelting girlfriend with McDonald's sweet and sour packets. <laughs> Google it. I'm telling you, that was a legitimate headline. Or today's October 10th, right? Florida man accused of forcing small alligator to drink beer. <laughs> right? But just because I'm going down there doesn't mean I need to be that guy. But you know me, right? So maybe look for the headlines this week. <laughs> right? Because I'm heading south, y'all. And if you can't beat them, join them, right? But the thing about this is just because I'm heading south doesn't mean that my, my mind, my heart, my body, my soul needs to go there, right? 
So all of a sudden, we have three people who are walking in the same direction, down and away from the presence of God, unaware of the opportunity to invite the love of God into the circumstance. Which leads me to my second thing. Ascension awareness. Ascension awareness. So the Samaritan is heading up toward the presence of God, from Jericho toward Jerusalem, up towards the presence of God. And I want to say this, the descent is a lot quicker than the ascent, right? You're walking downhill, and if you're a little bit chunky like me, uh, your, your, your muffin top carries your body a little faster downhill than it does uphill, right? So, so the descension goes a lot quicker. So you're moving and you're moving. You don't have a lot of time to focus, to look around, to be aware. You're just trying to watch your step, your footing going down this path so you don't fall. But uphill, you go a little slower. Anybody in here go uphill faster than they go downhill? I didn't think so, right? So the Samaritan, well, he's going a little slower. He's going the right direction. He has the opportunity to take his time, to be a little more aware, to look around with each step that he's taken. And he comes across this man who's been beaten and robbed and in compassion, he goes over to him. And he does something crazy, right? Isn't it sad that, that crazy is the good thing in this story, right? He helps this man who's hurt. Not only is he hurt, but he's incredibly different from him. We're talking about a Jew and a Samaritan. They were at odds all the time. This was kind of their race war at the time. This was their injustice. You know, you know what they called Samaritans? You know what Jews called Samaritans? Dogs. That was like their nickname. This guy who was different from him. Not to mention, not only was he different, but it was evident that he was in descent. This guy that was different from him and was in descent also had nothing to offer him because he was naked and bloody on the side of the road. Now in my mind, I imagine this, this Samaritan was on his way to a market somewhere and he, because he had all these supplies. He had olive oil, he had wine, he had bandages. He might have been going to the market uh, on this trade route because this path, this 18-mile path, was a huge trade route from Jericho to Jerusalem, Jerusalem to Jericho, right? And he took time to cleanse and soothe this man's wounds with the supplies that he had, with what he had. He didn't cross over to the other side. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't snub his nose. He didn't say, well, he's been calling me a dog all my life. Gets what he deserves, right? He's in descent. He gets what he deserves. He has nothing to offer me. He gets what he deserves. Imagine, I want you to imagine, instead of Facebook fights and Twitter wars, if we took the time to cleanse and soothe, How do you think that would work out? If instead of snubbing our nose, if instead of fighting, we took the time to cleanse and soothe, I think people would be a lot less scary if we took the time that the Samaritan did, right? And then he puts him on his donkey and he, head toward, he heads towards Jerusalem with him, which means the direction for the man who was bloody and beaten on the side of the road has all of a sudden changed because of the Samaritan, right? Instead of descending, he is now ascending toward the presence of God because the direction of the Samaritan changed his perception of what was going on. Instead of seeing an obstacle, he saw an op opportunity. So let me ask, which direction are you heading? Are you in descent right now? Not indecent, but in descent. <laughs> are you ascending? at a pace that allows you to be aware. And before you answer that, I want you to think about my, my final point, okay? Because stories like this, church, happens at our expense, all right? 
at our expense. Now, I feel like this point in the story gets passed over quite a bit, right? Because everything that happened in this story was at the expense of the Samaritan, the one doing the good deed, right? It cost his time. It cost his supplies, his money. It cost his safety. This wasn't a safe thing for him. I want you to think about this. He stops literally where a guy has just been robbed and beaten. Doesn't sound safe. Doesn't sound smart, right? And not only does he stop there, but he whips out all these supplies, wine and and olive oil. And he sounds successful, so it's probably extra virgin olive oil even, right? (laughs) A chef's dream. And he takes, he takes the time, right? Probably uses the wine because of its alcohol content to, to clean his wounds, right? And this olive oil probably, probably allows it not to dry out. And he wraps it with bandages and he allows this guy to, to heal. And not only does he does that, do that, he puts him on his donkey and continues. You know what sucks? Walking uphill. <laughs> you know what's better than walking uphill? riding a donkey uphill. And so now this guy is walking uphill so that this victim can ride his donkey uphill, right? Then there's something weird about this story. We have a Samaritan at a hotel in Jerusalem amongst these people who call his people dogs all the time. But for some reason... Right? I want to add this. Some reason they must know and trust this Samaritan, which says something about his character. Right? Because he's comfortable enough to walk in there with a beat up Jewish guy. Right? I mean, no joke. Puts him in a room, drops two days' wage on the counter, and says, Take care of this guy for me. At his expense. Because it was right. I want you to calculate two days' wage for you. What's two days' wage for you? Would you give that to someone right now? Huh? Now, for me, it would be a lot. Because (laughs) I work one day a week. So two days' wage is technically two weeks' wage for me. All right? I'm just throwing that out there. But two days wage, right off the bat, would you just give that to somebody you don't know? Somebody that you're supposed to hate and somebody that's supposed to hate you. Because this is what he does. He helps at his expense. If we could do more of that, people would be less scary. Right? I wouldn't fear people so much. Church, if we're going to be who we are called to be, it will have to be at our expense. If you are going to be who you are called to be, it's going to have to be at your expense, all right? It'll be at the expense of our pockets. It'll be at the expense of our pride and our power. And sometimes, yes, even the principle. Not the principle, but the principle, right? Dan's a principle, literally a principle, right? We're not going to kill you for this, okay? <laughs> the, the Samaritan spent all of these in order to change the directional focus of this man. He did. This regular dude, just doing his job, coming across a situation to do what is right. And what will we do? What will we do in this situation? There are a lot of people, broken, bloody, in descent, with nothing to offer us. As I close, Paul writes this to the church in Philippi, right? He says, is there, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any, any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't don't look out for your own interests, 
but take an interest in others too. You, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as the same or as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took a humble position of a, a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and in heaven on earth and under the earth and every uh, tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you see this? This is basically the gospel version of the story of the Good Samaritan. Right? A short story of dissension from heaven to earth. Ascension from earth to heaven. Right? Right? A story of humanity, how we were the ones that were laying on the side of the road. Just getting the tar beat out of us by sin. And at his expense, at his expense, Jesus came to heal, to care for us, to make sure that we were going to be all right. So let me ask. Who are you in this story? If you're not the Samaritan, then as a church, how can we help you change direction? How can we help you make that turn from descension to ascension? How can we take you from running from God to bringing you closer to the presence of God. I want you to think about that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for your grace and your mercy. I thank you for the fact that you took on what we deserve and you didn't give us what we deserve. Lord, allow us to be, allow us as your church to be that vessel of hope that you intend us to be. Allow us to be aware. Allow us to understand that this is going to come at our expense. To be that hope to the world. To be that vessel of hope in the world. To to lead people who are bloody and broken and bruised. And different from us and have nothing to offer us. To allow us to lead them to you. Lord, help us be that. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Thank y'all so much for being here with us this Sunday. We'll see you back next week, y'all. Thanks again.